So hi again, everyone. For those who doesn't know me, I'm Monica Gamboa, the social media manager at RBFF. So I'm here to introduce uh, Katie Grant, communications director at Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Katie uh, began working in the DNR's award-winning Office of Communications in August 2018 focusing her time on the agency's social media and digital presence. She got her start in communications through her own business of teaching coaches how to build the social media presence and has worked in various industries, including nonprofit events, restaurants, and grocery stores. She's currently serving as vice president and Midwest representative for government social leadership council. So please let's welcome her. Thank you. All righty, hello everyone. They were not lying, these lights are really bright today. How's everyone doing today? Everyone's still awake after lunch? We're not falling asleep? I feel like I might be, but you know, here we are. Um, I am here to talk to, you guys, talk to you today about the art of digital dialogue, and I will start by saying that this is one of those topics that I can nerd out about for like the next 27 hours, so this is a preview. If you want to nerd out with me, come find me and let's talk. Um, so to get started, what is digital dialogue? Um, by that, I mean putting the social in social media, uh, having those conversations in the comments, in direct messages, um, and having that uh, kind of two-way communication to build relationships with your audience using social media as your tool. Um, so the stats on the screen here are from a recent 2024 uh, Sprout Social report study that they did uh, called the Sprout Social Index. Uh, and I think they're really great at highlighting the importance of actually doing this. So 76% of consumers notice and appreciate when businesses prioritize customer support specifically on social media. Additionally, 63% of consumers agree their loyalty to a brand is significantly influenced by the quality of customer service they provide through social media. So it can be really, really impactful for us. Now, I know some of you guys maybe uh, have been in the room in the last couple of years when Jay Bear spoke here at RBFF. Uh, he is the author of a book called Hug Your Haters and um, this book is really what fuels our social media strategy. Um, I had heard of it when I landed here at the DNR in 2018. Uh, and employing this strategy, which really at its core um, is, is taking advantage of those haters, turning them into advocates and using them to your advantage, that seemed like the easiest way to kind of like take my first step towards improving the social media presence of the DNR. So, uh, great book, highly recommend if you haven't read it before. Um, but a couple of, of very interesting stats from it that uh, I always think are very eye-opening. So 33% of all customer complaints are never answered or addressed in any way, shape, or form, the majority of those coming in via social media. Answering a complaint, which can be as simple as like, Hi, I see you, I hear you, sorry that you've experienced that. Answering those complaints increases customer advocacy for your brand by as much as 25%. And not answering that complaint decreases customer advocacy by as much as 50%. So it can be a really, really critical and helpful thing for you to employ uh, as part of your social strategy. Now, bottom line, it's really helpful for us to start building those relationships now. I like to think of it as a cup, right? Every interaction you have with that audience fills that cup just a little bit. So that when you have to deliver bad news, when something bad happens for your agency, there's still something left in that cup for you to pour, right? You've, you've built that rapport over time uh, and there's still something there for you. So it's important to kind of get ahead of that and start building that now so that when crisis happens, which 
inevitably it will to all of us at some point, you have a little something there to give. So we get a lot of hate. Who has, who has gone to their Facebook section, Facebook page, gone to the comment section and you're like, Jesus, I don't wanna keep reading, this is so miserable. Yeah, show of hands? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. We get a lot of it. This is good and bad, it means that our followers are passionate about what we do, which I think um, is one of the best parts of working for a DNR. Uh, people care. When I was working for restaurants, or restaurants and grocery stores, no one, no one cares about the produce that you have there, right? Fishing, hunting, they care. So you get a lot of hate. These are just a couple of examples that we had. This took me like four seconds to pull even fishing specific ones because it's everywhere. But we also get a lot of love. And we've really used that to deputize our community and have them almost serve as our social media police. And I'll get to more of that in a second. Um, but they are in the comments regularly defending the work that we do and not just the work that we do in the field to protect and enhance Wisconsin's natural resources, defending the work that we do on social media, the work that we do to educate and communicate with the public. So how did we get here? This has been a long journey. I'm gonna give you just kind of a little preview here. Um, but all of this is to say that it has evolved over time. This was not an overnight thing. So I started at the DNR in August of 2018. At that time when I came on board, comments, direct messages had not been monitored at all for years. I'm talking, yeah, I heard the oh wow over here somewhere. <laughs> I'm talking like there were over like 500 unread direct messages with everything from complaints to admissions of poaching to you name it in the direct messages and no one had been reading them. So at that time we were kind of just building our baseline, figuring out what, what is this situation that I've gotten myself into? And at that point our average weekly reach on Facebook was about 187,000 people, which at that time, not bad at all. Our following was about, uh, I should have written this down, 150,000, I think. Don't quote me on that. I think it may have been a little bit lower. Um, but at a time when organic reach on Facebook was plummeting, that was pretty fantastic. In 2019, we had new leadership. There was an election at the end of 2018, if everyone has forgotten about that. Um, and so we had a new governor, we had a new secretary, and we had a new comms director, which was fantastic. Those people um, understood the importance of social media. They understood the importance of modernizing our communications, which did make employing the strategy a lot easier, but I'll get more to that in a minute. Uh, but we started putting this strategy into place, and as you can see, our average weekly Facebook reach went up to over 232, almost 233,000, which, big gap, especially when you keep in mind that organic reach and engagement was, was decreasing rapidly. 2020, we embraced a lot of haters. We had to close parks. I'm sure you guys like remember there was something happening there that, yeah, things weren't going well. Um, we also kind of started building our team. Uh, at that point, we saw the importance and the need for so more social media capacity. So we started taking our public information officers who previously had been solely focused on traditional media and a little bit weaving them into the world of social. Um, but still, for the most part, it was just me reading and responding to comments with some help here and there from some others. And in that year, in 2020, we increased that reach uh, weekly on average to 459,000. Now, stick with me. I'm sure you're thinking, well, COVID, anomaly year, everything went wrong. You had a lot of bad things happening that increased that, that reach. And that is very, very true. Uh, but I ran the numbers last week. And for 2023, our average, week, or average weekly reach on Facebook was over a million. So it's just kept going straight up as traditional Facebook organic reach is going down. I will caveat by saying right off the bat that I don't expect this to hold for 2024 because of two things. One, it's down right now. Um, in part, I'm assuming because it's kind of our slow season. 
January, February, always pretty slow for us on, sh on social media. We have a really high November, our deer season is huge, and then we drop off a little bit. But also, it's an election year. And when we look back at those 2022 numbers, those did go down slightly from 2021, but not nearly back to these 2018, 2019, 2020 numbers, which tells me that even in a bad election year where people are avoiding any form of media, we're not gonna see that drop off quite as much as we otherwise would have. So what does this look like for us? We base this on three basic principles defending and correcting misinformation where we can, providing service excellence in those comments and direct messages, and being as quick and timely as possible. So, another question that I tend to get when this comes up is, how do, how do I get anyone on board with this, right? So let's start there as we look at how you could maybe implement this. So getting leadership buy-in, like I said, for me, this was a lot easier because I had a new secretary, a new comms director at the time who were on board with what I wanted to do. They understood the importance of social media. But I will say over the last year, we had a new secretary who wasn't bought into this and tried to kill our social media. And I was able to do a lot of these things to kind of get that to stick around. So the first thing is really showing that data. And not just showing, but giving them the why. Why does this matter? What do these numbers mean, right? They might not understand that a million people reached every week on Facebook is really impressive and a kind of big deal. So show them why that's important. Spend the next two to three weeks, maybe two to three months, gathering that baseline data to say this is kind of where we've been and then start reporting to them on this is where we're going or this is where we are so they can see those ups and downs and, and really better understand what that all means. Share compliments. Uh, this can be anything, and these are all real examples, anything from buy this social media person a beer, their patience is outstanding, to give them a raise to maybe my all-time best compliment I've ever received, who's running this account? Two raccoons in a trench coat? <laughs> Share those because it not only shows your value to your organization, but it also shows that the public recognizes what you're doing and that you're there. They see you, they see that this is working, they're following you and they are like sucked in on what it is that you're doing. Um, lead them to the celebrations. Is that one million a week worth celebrating? Show them. I will tell you that my boss, I report directly to the um, deputy secretary. He doesn't know anything about social media, and that's okay, it's not his job to. He's like budget finance guy, totally different world, I get it. Um, but if I go to him and say, hey, we hit a million last week, he's gonna be like, okay, cool, what's next? But if I go to him and I'm like, hey, we did this really cool thing, I'm super proud of the team, he will then bring it up on our next department leadership team meeting and be like, look, this is really cool, let's celebrate them for this. So show them, they don't always know. Make it easier for them to get excited for what you're doing. And then last but certainly not least when it comes to leadership is maybe the scariest one of all, and that's advocating for your needs. It's hard. There's no other way to say it. It is really, really hard to tell leadership, hey, I need help, right? Um, looking back to 2020, uh, I was the only person doing direct message triage at the time, and it started to pick up like crazy. I mean, we had posts reaching a million people per post, and it was like, this is, I, like, I can't refresh. We're getting new comments every three seconds. So I started literally just keeping tallies in my planner of how many direct messages a day I was responding to, because we didn't have Sprout Social yet. And I was like, this, I have to be able to show them how bad this is right now. We got to the point that we were, um, I, I was responding to 200 direct messages a day on top of everything else, and went to my boss with that. And so when I would come to her and say, hey, social media, it is taking its toll on me right now. I need to step away for an hour. She was like, yes, get out of here, forget about it, don't worry about it. 
overcome that fear. Your boss wants the best for you. They want success for everyone at the end of the day. So just tell them what you need because they probably don't know. My boss at the time did not have keys to the car of Facebook and Instagram and the like. Now, I, I maintain it myself and I can see how bad it's getting for my staff, but sometimes I still need them to come to me and say, this is what I need because you just can't always see it. Getting that buy-in across programs is also helpful. Um, for me, this was the hardest part, to be quite honest. I, right now, lead up the entire central office of our communications, but we have all of our little silos of fish and wildlife and our three and all of that that scatter around us. And so we need to rely on them to get info to us. I know very, very little about a lot of things, which makes me great fun at parties. I know all of the fun, like weird facts, but I need to rely on those experts to get me the information because I can't identify a muskie. I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, I, I can't do it. Um, so getting that buy-in from them is the hardest. They have heavy workloads themselves. They're in their own other silo. Uh, so some things that work for us. Um, communicate really clearly what you need. Uh, we will get, let's say it is a false info something or other. That's just a comment, it's not a question. But we need to correct it in some way. Rather than just sending them the comment for them to be like, well, this isn't a question, what the heck am I responding to? I will rephrase that into a question and say, hey, here's what I need an answer to, to make it as easy as possible for them. Uh, additionally, give context. So if we do a post, let's say, about sturgeon spearing, and on that post we get a question about hook and line fishing for sturgeon, that may be really helpful context for them in figuring out how to answer the question, because there may be other things at play that need to be included in that answer. So be as clear as possible, um, phrase those questions in a way that will help them understand what you're really looking for, and then give that context. Additionally, set expectations. Um, some may say that our expectation is a little crazy, but it comes back to offering that timely response. We expect everyone that we send a question to to get back to us within four business hours. So if I send you a question at 2 p.m., I need a response by 10 a.m. Now, if you're in the field, you might not be able to get that back to me and that's okay, but I need a response within that time saying, hey, sorry, I'm in the field. It's gonna take me a hot second. I'll have this for you by four o'clock today or whatever, just some sort of an ETA so we know what to expect so we can get back to that customer and help set their expectations. Say thanks, often. Uh, it can feel like a no-brainer, but again, you're asking people to take time out of their cool job that they're doing to help you do your job. So just saying thanks goes a really long way. And then give out those gold stars. Uh, if I'm looking at Teresa because she's, she's just in my line of vision here. But if someone comes on our social media and says, Teresa hosted a really great class this week. It was fantastic. I loved it. I'm going to send that along to her. And I'm going to CC her boss so that she can also get the gold star from her boss because that's great, right? Um, additionally, if a post that they've helped you work on is doing really well, let them know. Just It's helpful to get that feedback that the thing that you've done has made an impact in some way. So briefly, what does our workflow look like? Uh, this has very much evolved over time. As I said, I started just being the sole person doing social media. We're up to myself and two others right now working on it, and we have two more in training. So we've grown a lot, which means that this workflow has evolved a bit. But what it looks like right now, uh, we do a weekly content meeting. Every Thursday, hour to an hour and a half, we look at the incoming requests that we've gotten. And we also uh, brainstorm. What are we getting a lot of questions on in the comments? What are we having a lot of misinformation swirl around? How can we use that data to inform the other content that we're doing this week? Uh, we triage daily, uh, so looking at what comments are coming in every day rather than saving it all up to do in big chunks. It's way easier in five to 10 minute increments than it is doing it 300 to 1,000 comments at a time. It also helps on that timely side of things. Use talking points. This is something that you're gonna hear me say about five more times because it is so critically helpful for us. 
This doesn't have to be a whole five to 10 page talking point document. It can literally be uh, what are the two to three most likely questions that we'll get on this post? What are the answers to those? Now I have them ready in my back pocket when we get those questions and I can just copy paste and go. This allows us to only send about 20% of the questions that we get to those subject matter experts. The rest we're handling on our own, either from questions we've had over the years that we've been here, those talking points, or from using our website and other resources. But they're really, really helpful and have, have helped us streamline a lot. And then I do always recommend getting a second set of eyes. So even though I'm not the one in there every day looking at the comments anymore, I am quickly reviewing every single response that we send out, both from a contextual, is there anything weird that we maybe shouldn't be saying or that we need to flag standpoint, just to like help it, it helps with confidence, I think, too, just if you're, it's your first time doing this, you've never interacted in this way before, it feels like a safety net. And then also, when I'm doing it and also my staff, when they're doing it, we're normally doing like 16 different things at once. And uh, so proofing is, is something, you know, you're just moving so quickly, it's easy to miss little tiny typos. And so we, we just always have a second set of eyes for that as well. But, I get to it like during meetings. It's one of those kind of like halfway mindless tasks that I can do in the background while I'm listening to someone else talk. So it's not like it's sitting there for long. We're able to kind of keep the ball rolling on that pretty well. Some tools that I recommend real quickly to help uh, highly recommend a project management tool. We use Asana uh, in our Office of Communications. That is also our kind of intake form for all content. And it means that not only do we get that content, but then we have those talking points paired right with it. And it's an easy place to go back to to grab that information. Social media management tool, not necessary, but definitely helpful. We like Sprout Social. Buffer is another really great and affordable one to use that has a good uh, content moderation tool in it. And then I said I was gonna mention it like 12 more times, talking points. It is truly one of the things that has made this job uh, a lot easier to do. I'll go into each of these in a little bit more in depth on the next few slides, but some ideas of things to try out. I don't recommend going whole hog on this and just saying we are responding to every single comment forever, moving forward, period, end of story. If you've never done this before, try some of these things just to dip your toe in the water and see if you can like kind of start getting it rolling. So first up, hosting a Q&A. This is one of my absolute favorite things that we have done. They are work which is, cannot be underscored because we do them at night and that is rough. Uh, but they, the, the public loves them and it's kind of fun for us. So what does this look like? Instead of doing a Facebook Live with video, which doesn't feel super safe always, we do it literally on Facebook as comments. So we post a post that looks something like this. Uh, pro tip, I do recommend doing this directly in Facebook even if you use a social media tool. Use the little option where you can put a colored background on it and then it's just text. I don't know why this works, but it works so much better than doing like a pretty fish photo with text above it. There's something in the algorithm that makes this work. So go this route. We then all get on a Teams call from 5 to 7 p.m. and my team pulls the questions from Facebook, puts them in the Teams chat, the biologists, whoever, sit in the background on Teams, discuss what the answers are gonna be, they type it up, paste it back in, we copy paste it in, good to go. It moves really quickly, we get a lot of traction while it's live, but then it keeps going even after we're offline. So let's say we do this on a Thursday night like we did with this one, Friday morning, our team logs on, we grab all the questions that came in overnight, put it in one email, send it off to the whole group, they respond as they're able to throughout the day and we just keep pasting those answers in until there's no more questions coming in. It's a lot safer feeling for the biologists because if they don't know, they can, they can bounce it off of each other, right? They don't have to give an answer live on camera, which is one of the biggest pushbacks I used to get to Facebook Live. We've also paired it with doing um, an Instagram story at the same time. 
So use, there's a sticker on Instagram stories where you can have people ask your questions. You can either reply in an Instagram story or as a direct message. Uh, another great tool for that. I do recommend setting very specific guidelines, that timing, putting a specific topic to it. We do leave a comment that basically says, if it's off topic, we're not responding to you. If it's out of hours, we'll respond to you, but expect a delay. And then this is also really helpful for that future content planning as well. You can see what the more common questions are com that are coming up are, and you can use those, so on and so forth. Another great one, have to give a shout out to Michigan DNR here, uh, doing quiz or question type posts. So if you don't know Michigan DNR, every Friday does an Identif Friday post. It is a close up of a, an animal, a plant, something, people guess what it is. It is so popular, you'll see that bottom comment there, that they went a week without doing it and they started getting comments from people asking where it was. Because people love it right? And it drives engagement. You will have 300 people saying, that's a muskie. And people will keep commenting because they just want to be a part of it. They want to have fun. So set a regular cadence if you can. Your users will start to expect it. It can be as simple as this. We've also done them on Instagram stories where they have a, a choice to do it as a multiple choice uh, with things like test your recycling knowledge, test your whatever knowledge. People are just curious if they know the answers or they want to know the answers so they guess something stupid. And it's a lot of fun for your staff to put together as well. Host posts where you just ask people to share something. This was one where we basically said, hey, fishing season's over. How was your fall season? Everyone likes to feel like they are making their opinion known. And when we first did this, we really thought that it would turn into DNR, you've screwed up fishing in the state, you guys are the worst, get the heck out of here, I'm going to Iowa. It didn't happen. Guys, it didn't happen, which we were so surprised about. And the little bit where it started to fizzle up and happen, we've deputized our people. They jumped in and started defending us immediately and shut it down. So it wasn't a problem. Not only does that give them an opportunity to feel heard, it's really, really easy to engage with. Hey, cool photo. Do you know how many times we commented, hey, cool photo on that post? But people love it. And that furthers that engagement snowball and builds it up more in the algorithm and it all just keeps rolling. Just be present. This may seem like such a no brainer, but it works so much better than you ever think that it will. So someone tags Monica on the post and just says, Monica. And it's only her name with like her little user uh, hyperlink, right? We could not respond to that. But why not respond and thank them for sharing? It's a little thing, but it goes a really long way. We've had people re reply to that and be like, oh my god, I'm a celebrity. The DNR is responding to me, right? They get really excited about that. Did they share a cool photo? Compliment it, right? These are really simple incremental things and when the world gets busy, this is the first thing that we stop doing because it does take a lot of time. But it shows that you're there. It shows that this isn't an information void where trolls can sit and hang out and can say whatever the heck they want. When we started becoming more present and just showing up and showing that we do read every single comment, the trolls started to decrease. We still get them, <laughs> don't get me wrong, we, we get them but it helps a lot. Correct misinformation, we call this our classy clapback. Uh, you feel a little sassy doing it and it's kind of fun, a little bit gratifying. The key to it is focusing on facts, not emotion, right? So the bottom one here, it's someone going off about the fact that we couldn't shut down the sturgeon sparing season because there wasn't ice. Well, the DNR doesn't monitor ice conditions and also statutorily we have to host it on specific days ice or not, and you have to spear through the ice whether there's ice or not, right? So statutorily, nothing we can do about it. But this guy's saying, well, like, you can limit the time and the number of fish that we're spearing, so why can't you shut it down? Okay. Hey, thanks for the comment. On the, under the current rule, the sturgeon spearing season opens on this day, regardless of weather. Here's a link to the statute. Read it for yourself, right? It's just providing information. Straightforward, right? It fills that information void. Now, 
I like to say I will feed a troll an appetizer, maybe a first course. They are not getting a full five course meal out of me. So I will give them a little bit, right? We'll respond. If this person responded six more times, continuing to all caps yell at us and just say nonsense, all right, then I'm, I'm washing my hands, I've tried. But other people are reading those comments, right? So I might not be brave enough to ask the question myself, but I'm gonna lurk. I'm gonna read those comments and seeing the right information might change my mind even if it doesn't change this person's mind. Real quick, couple mistakes and lessons learned, not anticipating big posts. The things you think are gonna do well, never do. The things you think are gonna flop are always gonna do really well, right? We use those content planning meetings to some extent to kind of test this, poke holes. Where are people gonna get antsy? Where are they gonna have questions? That gives, buys us a little bit of time to go back to the program and ask, hey, we think we're gonna get this question. Can you get us some talking points on this, right? Not considering the First Amendment. I had no idea that there were considerations for this when I started at the DNR, full disclosure. We can't delete comments, right? Check with your legal team, see it's a little bit different in every state, but I cannot delete a comment no matter how racist, no matter how many swear words you put in it, whatever, doesn't matter. I can't delete it, it just stays there, right? It is really disheartening at times. For example, our tribal uh, fishing season last spring, lots of racism. It was really difficult to read through but we have to leave it, it just is what it is. I would rather protect the agency from a lawsuit standpoint than try to go toe to toe with some people who are just saying crazy opinions. And that's okay, they can, they can have their opinions, that's allowed. Um, and I think personally, my personal thought on it is that it says more about who they are than who I am or who the agency is, so do your thing. But I have to follow the, the First Amendment considerations there. Trying to do too much with too little, which kind of flows into the lesson learned of building capacity. Um, you're only one person. Start small and experiment. Try hosting a Q&A. Just do one. See how it goes. You don't have to go all in and do all of the things right away. Also focus on the progress, not the perfection, right? There are times where we average a thousand comments a day during deer season. It's insanity. There there's no way we can keep up with it. And that's when that kind of throwing out the just being present piece comes into play. We'll stop responding to people just tagging their friends and let that go. And we'll focus more on reading every comment to make sure we're not running into issues of people admitting to poaching in the comments that we need to send to the wardens, which happens like at least once a week, or other things like that where we need, we need to get involved. We can't just let it go. Uh, and then, Really focus on self-care, be good to yourself. Hanging out all day, every day in the comments is not for the faint of heart at all. Uh, it, is, it is rough some days in there. Take five minutes. If it is a beautiful day, go walk the dog, get some fresh air, do something, build that boundary and, and be good to yourself. And then what does the future look like for us? So we've really mainly bought into this on Facebook. We do it to some extent on the other platforms, uh, but Facebook is just where we have the biggest audience. It's the most engaged. It's where people are the most passionate. So it's really easy to do it there, but really trying to be more mindful of incorporating some of these things into um, Instagram or LinkedIn or wherever else that we're doing it. Continuing to get that buy-in. Uh, we are going to have a new secretary someday. We're not gonna keep, keep operating as we are without one. Uh, and that's okay. Leadership changes. You're gonna have to keep getting that buy-in. Same thing in the programs. You're gonna have new fisheries biologists who come in, who you have to convince to work with you on the four-hour rule, right? Keep getting that buy-in as you go. It gets easier the more you do it. Continue to keep leadership engaged. Uh, keeping them in the loop, keeping them celebrating what it is that you're doing and understanding the importance of using these really great tools, love them, hate them. Social media is a great tool to reach a lot of people really quickly. And then developing routines to support our staff. Um, so now that we have a team, figuring out a way to have some sort of a rotation so that I'm not the one reading those comments all day every day and I can like pass it off and have a day without looking at the negativity. 
And then just adding in here, because I thought of it uh, this morning during the AI presentation, really looking at how we can, can better integrate AI into this. I hadn't really thought about it, but we do have uh, the auto responses turned on on Facebook already. So thinking about how we can maybe better use those to um, propel us forward and make this all a whole lot easier because it takes time, but it's really valuable and it's really, really important for us to do. So with that, thank you guys for being here uh, and choosing this session. Uh, like I said, this is one of those topics that I'm really, really passionate about because I've seen the impact it can have and frankly, I'm a social media nerd. I was talking to Monica about this before. Like you have to have that special kind of crazy to do this, uh, but it's a lot of fun. It's really cool to see that immediate impact because when you're in marketing and communications, it's not always immediate seeing the impact that you can have. So being able to use this in that way uh, can, can really be gratifying in that way. But if you have any questions, feel free to email. My email is there or I'll be at the expo tomorrow as well. Feel free to come chat with me. And with that, we have time for questions. Yeah, so thank you so much, Katie. So we have like 10 minutes for questions, so please We have one right behind hand. you, Monica, if you don't want to walk as far. Oh. <laughs> hey there, thanks so much for this presentation. Yeah. I really appreciated your point about having to recognize the First Amendment. and. I'm trying to kind of balance that with the fact that there, it's not as though not responding to, for example, blatant racism or other bigotry. It's not as though the only impact there is people's freedom of speech. And so I'm wondering, um, is that all you do is just kind of leave it or do you actually respond so it's not just hanging there with no response from the state? That is a great question. So uh, last year specifically, this has come up every year for the last several years. This last year was not the first year during our tribal uh, season that it happened. Last year though was when our secretary got mad about it and actually asked us to fully shut down social media completely forever after seeing those comments, which was way too rash of a move, right? Um, but so we legally looked into it to see what our options were. And there were a few things that we maybe could have done differently, but the risks kind of didn't outweigh the reward. The biggest thing that we will reply with is um, something along the lines, far more eloquent, but something like, uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, this is an open public forum. We appreciate where you're coming from. If you believe that this violates Facebook's rules of community engagement or whatever they call it, you can click the three dots and report it and have Facebook review it. And that was mostly for like other readers who were seeing those comments and being upset by it? Yes, that was mostly for the other readers who might read it and be upset about us just being silent on it. Okay, so supporting them but not directly engaging with the bigots. Correct, yes. Okay, yep. Other questions? Hey. Yes. Hi. Um, I had a question about your workflow. So you've got the content meeting at the beginning of the week. How do you guys balance or prioritize like requests from programs? Because you know everyone wants you to talk about their thing. So how do you guys think through and prioritize and, and work through that inflow? That's a great question. Uh, when it comes to actually planning the content, the posts that we're going to post, so we have an intake form in Asana where we just say, submit your thing. Um, I believe we generally say the cutoff is like, have everything for the next week in by 10 a.m. on Thursday. And then Thursday afternoon is when we meet. So we just go through everything. There are times throughout the year where we get to a point where we don't have enough space. Now keep in mind, not everything goes on Facebook. Not everything makes sense for that platform. So. Part of it is that we balance it across a lot of platforms, but then we rarely run into issues, at least in the last couple of years, where we have too much content. Our biggest thing that we do is try to just balance. So if we're doing two wildlife posts in a day, we'll try to put a parks post in the middle or something so that it's kind of changing it up so you're not cannibalizing your own message almost, right? So if I'm into fisheries, I see something about fishing that I like, but if I'm also not about consumptive sports at all and I just want parks content, I'm also kind of getting a mix like that. So we try to make sure that there's just a balance in every week. And then as we look at filling in the holes, we kind of look at where are we getting the most questions, where are we seeing the most information, and how can we fill in those gaps with kind of the other things. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. 
Hi, back to the First Amendment. Uh, we also cannot delete, but we can hide. Um, our communications department does have that provision and we do exercise that occasionally. Do you, are you guys not able to hide even? Yeah, no, um, our legal team has found that because, so if you are the one who comments and your comment is hidden, you don't know that your comment was hidden. You can't see that, it still shows for you and your friends. Um, so our legal team actually determined that that is even worse than deleting because it's censoring without them knowing that they're being censored. Um, so yeah, we talked about that, but that was one of those ones where we just said, nope, gonna leave it. Yeah. I have two questions. Do yeah. you use a profanity filter or does that go to the hide? And then my second question is, like, how do you deal with spam? I found spam on Facebook has just gotten to another level in the past year. It's insane. And I, I have profanity filters set up just for like common emojis that those spam accounts are using, selling t-shirts and all these other horrible things. So do you just let those lie? We do let them lie right now. So our test was kind of, do we want there to be a question of like a human element deciding is this actually spam or not? And ultimately we decided the risk of having that bias in there was just a little too strong. We did used to have the profanity filters on. We ultimately decided to turn them off just to err on the side of caution because let's face it, most of the time when people are swearing, it's they have a strong opinion and that is getting hidden. And so ultimately we just didn't want that to get called into question that we were censoring that in any way um, because it, it just, there was too much possible gray area there where it could get in trouble. Um, but definitely on all things First Amendment, talk to your legal teams more than me, uh, because every state is just a little bit different and what you might be able to get away with might be different from one state to the next. Yeah? Yes, uh, quick question. You mentioned the four hour rule when working with your new fisheries biologists. What, what was that again? Is that you have to reply within four hours? Yeah, so if we get a question, we expect whether it's a fisheries biologist, a property planner, whoever, to get back to us within four business hours. That just gives us kind of a, a gauge for when we need to follow up so that it doesn't sit out there forever. Uh, the other side of it too is in providing that timely communication to those interested customers, right? Yeah, there are times where I'm able to get to a comment three minutes after it's posted and that's not an issue. And so any speed is quick to them because it's, it's fairly immediate. That said, if a comment is made at 5 p.m. on Friday, I'm not looking at it until at least 8 a.m. on Monday. So they've already waited a couple of, t of days add at least four more hours on top of it, right? And it starts to get a long time before they have a response. So it just kind of gives us a meter, a gauge to kind of keep things flowing and making sure that we're getting that timely communication. Yeah. Here. So on that same topic, how did you go about communicating that expectation with these various experts? Uh, a lot of trial and error. Uh, so we, the way that we're set up, we have our central comms office, we have the programs. For the most part, within each of those programs, we also have comms liaisons who are kind of the conduit between the field and us and funnel things in. So we started really with just working with them. They get CC'd on everything that we send to everyone. So if I'm sending a question to Teresa, her division comms person is being CC'd on that. Uh, so they kind of have helped a little bit, but we did a lot with um, internal newsletters and just working with leadership. You know, if we had a town hall, we would have our secretary talk a little bit about comms and remind of the importance of this. Because at the end of the day, making sure that we did this quickly was something that was really coming from him. Um, we have to remind people pretty regularly. If we don't get an answer, we follow up. And we also, if we don't get an answer, we will follow up just reminding them, hey, thank you for the answer now that we finally have it. As a reminder, our expectation is this. If you're not able to, we understand, just let us know. Yeah. 
Um, so my question is, is kind of similar about the capacity building and moving from where you started in 2018 with just you um, to having sort of these different policies in an intake form. Um, that's kind of somewhere that I'm, right now it's just me, um, and, and our team is trying to build out some, some more policies and roll them out to the different divisions and programs. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering, I guess, what do you think was the biggest like step forward that you were able to take or the most important part of that? Um, and then maybe how you rolled out those policies, if it, if it was like an official policy, I kind of think you touched on it, if it comes from leadership or, or some, yeah. you know, ways to roll it out to get the least amount of pushback and to really make it more of like a collaborative process. Yeah, you're absolutely gonna have pushback. Um, and I know we're coming up to time, so I'll give you the high level answer and then maybe let's talk more later. Um, the biggest thing I think was recognizing the need seeing what the actual volume was. So I started in August, my comms director who helped me do all of this at the time, uh, she started in roughly April 2019. So we didn't know, you know, everything we do is very cyclical. We have our really busy times. We didn't know what it was gonna look like. So we started just kind of gathering data and it was around spring of 2020, shortly before everything went wrong, um, that we started to see, okay, there's a need for this how do we maybe restructure? And that was when we kind of took um, a look at overall how we could shift those more traditional focused PIOs into having a role in what we were doing. So it wasn't a full on change, it wasn't a full on policy switch, it was more just kind of a, a shift and that has continued to slowly happen over the next four years. So I think we're at time. Yeah. Thank you guys.